Hello, everybody, and welcome. As folks are coming in, we're going to spend about a minute. Um, I'm going to spend about a minute just going over a couple of things. So um, we will be sending the recording of this webinar to everybody who registered. Um, so hello, those of you who are watching this after the fact. Um, if you have any questions at all about anything that comes up in the webinar, you can reach out to me. Um, I'll, my email is right here. Um, you can also reach out to Gretchen Giggin, who um, runs our member services uh, for all of our different products and is also a librarian, um, really is a font of knowledge about how the OSF works. She's also on this call to answer any questions you may have. You can just drop your questions in the Q&A section. That way we can make sure we're answering all of them um, as, um, as I'm speaking. So feel free to drop those there. Um, if you'd like, you can introduce yourself in the chat um, or um, feel free to reach out to us afterwards via our email. Um, so um, I'll also be sharing the slides with you. So there's a number of slides that um, will have some links to them. I'll be kind of going over what's in those links um, just as a reference for you to return back to um, in your own time, um, depending on how much time we have, I may open them up. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Nadia Ortelt. I'm our strategic partnerships manager at the Center for Open Science. Um, I am the kind of uh, initial person many of you might talk to if you are interested in uh, signing up for OSF institutions. Um, I might also introduce you to Gretchen uh, Gigan, our um, member services um, uh, manager. Um, if it's appropriate, we can give you a demo. Um, we're the people who, who you initially talk to to see, is this the right tool for you? And hopefully this webinar will give you a sense of whether or not it is the right tool. Um, and generally, just so you understand, we're trying to kind of cater the audience of this uh, webinar to those of you who might have um, some power to sign up for new tools, new services, uh, training, software, etc. Um, so we're speaking to uh, research support staff, usually within institutional libraries or uh, administrative positions. Um, if that's not you, that's totally fine. Um, but just so you know, if you're a little bit confused as to some of the things I'm referring to. So, a couple of other things. So um, I want to just drop a couple of questions here for you. Um, uh, if uh, you can answer them, they're very helpful in helping us understand whether or not you have experience with OSF, if you understand what OSF is, and if you have uh, an OSF account. So if you just want to answer these questions while I'm chatting, um, that would be helpful. I know there's only about 20 of you um, in the webinar right now, which uh, is great. Um, uh, if you do have questions about any of these polling questions, just drop them in the chat, uh, or if they're about the OSF, you can drop them in the Q&A. Um, seems that there's a little bit of a spread here. Some are not familiar, some are very familiar. That's about what we see in these webinars, so that's great. So um, if you do have questions about um, OSF institutions, or if you're like, hmm, this software or this service does not seem like the right fit for what I actually need, um, you can go to our products page and see some of the other services that we offer, including OSF registries, OSF collections, um, and OSF preprints. So depending on what kind of um, aggregation or curation of material in the OSF you're looking for, um, you might, uh, it might be better suited to some of these other products for you. Um, and one thing you can do, again, while I'm talking, if you haven't done this, is make your OSF account right now. Um, so when you do that, you can very quickly, within five minutes, start a, a, um, an account and even, you know, make a public or private project to play around while I'm speaking. So, um, a couple of really basic things that often kind of create a little bit of confusion with the OSF that I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about. So OSF for individual users um, is always going to be free. Um, you can use it uh, for anything you'd like. We built the OSF for sharing research um, throughout the research kind of life cycle. So from early collaborative stages to, um, to uh, data files, to out research outputs, um, and those outputs, you know, could be a preprint, but they also could uh, take the form of uh, many other different types of uh, files or formats. Um, but that 
part of the OSF, the user base part is always free and anybody can, can create an OSF account um, as long as it's under their name. Um, you cannot create an OSF account for an organization or an institution and that's why we make the products, one of which I'll be talking about today. There are three things that any user can do on the OSF. So an OSF user can work in a project space and create a project, publish it. They can also um, make it private or public. They can collaborate with people with it on a project and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, they can also collaborate on uh, registration. Registration is a different kind of uh, workflow on the OSF. Um, and uh, I'll talk briefly about what that is. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's um, used more often in certain um, research disciplines than in others, although it's, it's growing in use. And also you can create or publish a preprint. So these are the three primary workflows that any user on the OSF um, is engaging with. And if you are research support staff, any user from your institution might already be doing these things on the OSF. And so I just wanna flag that, that um, if you are interested in knowing, oh, oh, who at my institution is actually publishing material on the OSF or using it, we can give you some basic set of uh, public uh, numbers about, um, about the users um, from your institution, from your domain. So a couple of things. What is a project on the OSF? So a project is a really excellent place for a team to be kind of showing their work, refining their ideas, their centralized workspaces. I like to think of it as a kind of centralized wiki almost where uh, data, materials, metadata, information about a project can be organized in one place or one space. Um, you can integrate with um, external uh, service providers, storage, citation tools. You can file, uh, upload uh, files and version and track them. There's an activity log. Um, you can separate out the organization of a project into different components so that different collaborators have different access to different components. You can also uh, modify privacy settings to be public or private on the entire project or components of a project. So you can really make a differentiation between material that anybody can see and material that collaborators can see and material that specific people can see. Um, and um, collaborators can be added from your institution or from other institutions. And if a project is made public, you can also mint a DOI for that project. And that can all be done, you know, with a, with a click of a button. So that's often a reason why a lot of researchers um, and users really like the project because it is, uh, it's not a preprint, it's something much, much more um, one thing to note, and these are great links to click through when I send this through to you um, after the webinar, we um, have a really robust metadata schema on the OSF um, and a lot of help guides around that metadata. So you can um, kind of dive into that and see um, what is available to users. Um, you can, um, as I said, mint DOIs for public projects. You can't mint them for private projects. It's part of our um, platform. We try to encourage users as much as possible to make material that they put on the platform public. Um, you can also uh, utilize your ORCID ID to log into the OSF and then sync all of your OSF content with your ORCID record, which is really uh, helpful um, for uh, finding material across the web. Um, and we are open source um, and we're a nonprofit. Um, so you can utilize our API to propagate data and metadata downstream from OSF projects and other material um, we have an engineering team, um, so if you have any questions about our API, um, Gretchen is here, she can answer them, but also we can uh, have further conversations about that too. So registrations. So registrations may be familiar to some of you who perhaps work in the social sciences, um, maybe less or in clinical research or healthcare research. For some of you, you may be like, what is a registration? OSF operates in kind of two ways as a registry for registrations. We, um, we are a generalist registry. So any person can just publish a registration on the OSF. We also offer another tool, which I'm happy to talk about at another time um, called OSF registry. So if your community, your research community, your organization, your group wants to start a, a moderated registry um, that has your branding on it, um, uh, that has a uh, curation capacity, moderation capacity, we can stand that up for you, kind of like a white labeled um, uh, discipline or research specific registry. Clinicaltrials.gov in the US is an example of a clinical uh, registry. The idea here is that when you register your research on the OSF, it's indelible. So it's a time stamped archived object on the OSF. Uh, in terms of its formats, similar to a project, but it cannot be deleted. So a project can be removed, it can be made private. 
a registration on the OSF is um, is forever. Um, and there, you know, there are some um, specifics around how that works. But the idea is that this is a really robust way to outline your research, your analysis plan uh, prior to starting your study. Um, there's a specific subtype of registration called a pre-registration. Um, that uh, specifies uh, more aspects of your research in advance of your study. Um, there's uh, a lot of documentation around registration and pre-registration on the OSF. Um, and usually if there are a lot of users from your institution who are registering or pre-registering their research on the OSF or elsewhere, it's usually an indicator of um, an attempt to create more reproducible um, and rigorous research. We also have a whole, um, part of the Center for Open Science, who is the nonprofit in which the OSF sits. Um, a whole part of our organization is dedicated to researching the, uh, the impact and efficacy of open scholarship tools like registrations. And so that's one reason why um, we emphasize this workflow on the OSF. I'm happy to talk about that more if you have questions or drop them in the Q&A. Um, some features that are really interesting on the OSF um, around registration that's different from um, uh, I would say registrations on other platforms is that because we have this flexible project to, uh, workflow, you can actually create a registration from your existing OSF project. And that maps really nicely onto how research actually happens. So you can use the OSF as an active research collaboration tool where you create a project, you're working actively through, um, through uh, the early stages of collaboration with other researchers. And at some point you decide I do want to register that research, you can essentially fork um, that existing OSF project into a registration and pull metadata and files from the parent project or the components and link that project with the registration. So um, you can also create a registration from scratch. Um, and the same goes, uh, or one way of thinking about um, workflows on the OSF is some people use the OSF simply as an archive. You've done the work already. You're, you're simply putting it there to share material, share your, you know, um, your research outputs. And other folks use it more as a collaboration tool. So as you're doing the work, you're in the process of um, uh, documenting, storing, sharing, and collaborating on the platform using these different workflows. So, oops, I'm not going to dive too much into preprints because I think everyone here is fairly familiar with what a preprint is. Um, the preprint workflow in the OSF um, is um, a fairly uh, straightforward workflow. Um, I have linked throughout this presentation to examples of um, preprints um, that have institutional affiliation on them, but I want to talk a little bit about how OSF institutions works. So at the moment, if you are at an institution right now, you may have a dozen or hundreds or thousands of users who have already put material on the OSF, um, and you may have new um, researchers in your community who are signing up to the OSF um, and publishing material on the platform or sharing files, uh, data files, or other types of material on the platform. What OSF Institutions does is it's a contract we make with an institution, so it's with an organization. We work with you to figure out who administrators might be who can have some access to information on the back end. But the way the mechanics of it work is that um, we work with you to make sure all of the existing users at your institution and future users will utilize your single sign-on um, authentication service um, to log into the OSF. And what that does is it allows for all the projects, all the registrations, all the preprints that are affiliated with your institution to be automatically aggregated under an institutional page. So that means that um, uh, like here, you see Case Western um, University has an OSF institutions page. Um, anything that anybody publishes um, is automatically aggregated to that page. And anything that a new user might publish um, who signs on using a single sign-on will aggregate to that page. What it also does is it adds your raw institutional identifier to metadata associated with those projects and registrations and preprints. And then that gets shared downstream in places like Datasite and ORCID, and it makes you easier to aggregate material in the OSF. So um, anybody who visits a page, whether it's a project, a registration, or a preprint, will know that researchers um, are officially affiliated with your institution on that page because there will be visible branding or, um, or it, uh, the metadata will indicate that that material is affiliated with your institution. Um, 
And one of the nice things about setting up OSF institutions is Gretchen, who's on this call, is there to figure out, you know, every institution is different. <laughs> there are many, many different uh, um, authentication, authentication services, but also ways in which libraries work to communicate with researchers, whether they're faculty and staff or graduate students or undergrads, to let them know about um, uh, this single sign-on uh, OSF uh, institutions account. Um, so we figure out the best way to communicate to existing users, future users, um, and create, and we have a lot of resources to, to help you um, uh, set up libguides or other types of help resources. Um, and one of the really powerful things that, uh, and one of the reasons why a lot of users use the OSF is that um, interoperability is sort of built into how, especially the project space works. So you can link to existing storage tools um, that your institution is already paying for, like Google Drive or OneDrive or Box um, uh, and other types of tools like GitHub or citation tools um, like um, Mendeley to, uh, to make sure that all the material that already exists in other places and services that you, you know, a user is already using can all be linked to a single project um, and um, therefore you know, also um, identified with your institutional affiliation and uh, metadata, which will connect it with that that project um, or registration or preprint. So the interoperable sort of nature of the OSF is, is a really powerful draw. Um, so this is just an example. Um, so in the OSF project space that you see here, this is what a project space looks like. Um, I've enabled here uh, integrations with Box, GitHub, Google Drive, and Zotero. So that means in this project space, um, I can pull in files and references from all of those tools into my project with the other materials um, that I created within the project or that I placed there, uh, uploaded there. So currently the OSF can integrate with 11 storage providers, two citation managers, and um, we're working on a really big integrations project, an add-ons project to make the addition of other different uh, integrated services simpler. So that's in the works now. Um, in addition, there are also a number of products that have built their own OSF integrations or extensions to work in the uh, in sort of unidirectionally, so to store and update OSF content from another application. So for some of those, we don't have the ability to to do the reverse, so to um, to uh, to change things within the OSF and and update in those applications. But that is something that we're working on, and our open API allows for this kind of development by anybody um, who has the uh, engineering or development chops. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about our API or about any of our um, add-ons. So. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna dive too much into this use case, but I just wanna flag, oops, that um, what you're looking at here is um, a couple of links that are all related to one of our institutional members, um, University of British Columbia. So the University of British Columbia has an OSF institutional page, which you can see here. Um, my, I have my screen quite small, so I'll make it a little bit larger here. So um, you can see here that on the um, institutional page for UBC, you have projects, registrations, preprints, files, users, um, and uh, one of the things I can show you is here's a UBC uh, affiliated project. So you can see here in the upper left, we have the UBC branding because the contributors here are coming from this affiliated use, uh, institution, University of British Columbia. I should note that this affiliated institution only will appear on a project if the institution is an OSF institution's member. We need to be able to verify that those contributors are actually in fact from that institution, not just saying they are. Um, hence the reason why you cannot, for example, search by institution if that institution is not uh, an OSF institutional member. You can also see here is a UBC affiliated registration. So on registrations, they look a little bit different, but you can see um, that um, on this registration, um, you have contributors, you have actually a link back to the associated project. Um, a DOI, and down here you also have the affiliated institution. And this is, um, these are the ROAR identifiers affiliated with UBC. You can see then also the uh, downstream link in data site um, to, uh, to the material that is, that is linked in UBC, um, as well as here's the, the entry for that same registration in um, data site. 
So I'll send you through all these links so you can um, have a look at them uh, on your own. Uh, if you do have any questions about that, please let me know. So a couple of other things to keep in mind for, um, uh, for an OSF institutional account, what do you get? So on the back end, um, materials automatically aggregated we work with you to make sure all the material that should be on the platform is there. Users that should be on the platform are sharing uh, in the way in which you want them to on that platform or on our platform. But you also get some insight into what all of your users are doing. Uh, just want to flag that this is a, a big development project that we're working on right now um, that is in flux. And uh, some of you who are here might have even gotten an email from me about changes to the metrics dashboard that are being made um, based on feedback from all of our uh, 60 plus member institutions um, about what they needed in terms of metrics. So at the moment, what you see on the left here is a basic simple metrics dashboard. That's what you'd see right now if you signed up today and we got you on as an admin. What you see on the right is um, just a page from a um, quarterly, uh, data metrics analysis that's done by Gretchen and her team, um, and that is done in conjunction with um, that simpler dashboard. In the future, at the end of this year, um, if you sign up at the uh, level at which you would receive dashboard tools, these will be merged together into a, a, a sort of synchronous dashboard where you can pull data, CSV files, um, metadata, information about your users and how they're using the platform. Um, on your own um, moving forward. It's a lot more powerful a dashboard. If you are interested in understanding what that metrics dashboard looks like and some of the sort of um, workflows associated with it, just shoot me an email and I can send you a really cool um, uh, run through that Gretchen has done um, of the mockups of uh, that update. So this is a kind of a, a big deal. Um, we've been working on it for a long time. Our engineering and product teams have been really trying to make sure that this serves uh, folks who have said to us, hey, this is amazing. I actually need more information. Can you tell me more about what my users are doing? So we're trying to um, get that out by the end of the year and uh, happy to talk more about that. Um, a couple of resources here that I've brought together um, that are examples of material in the OSF that are also support resources. Um, we have a whole, um, a, a lot of this material that we work with you to, to figure out what is, what's the best thing to point to on your own libguide, on your own uh, data management uh, pages, on your library site. Um, we also have some uh, examples of existing members that have created best practices projects that are almost like templates that can be forked for their users. Um, to use in different research contexts. Um, we also have a lot of uh, freely available OSF workshop uh, material that a lot of our member institutions have shared on the OSF. So these are just some examples for you. And I always like to point to this before I wrap up because I think it's a good example of um, best practices with one of our uh, OSF institutions members. So this is Virginia Commonwealth University who's been a member for many years. Um, they have a data science lab, um, which uh, Tim York runs. Um, Tim is kind of a champion um, at VCU for OSF with his team. And they shared with us um, some learnings about best practices for bringing hundreds of new OSF users to the platform every year and for using it in a way that's aligned with VCU's um, data sharing policies um, and other, you know, federally funded uh, research project mandates, et cetera, and data sharing mandates. Um, what we learned is that, you know, OSF is not just an out of the box tool that's going to use, uh, going to work for every institution in the best possible way without support. Um, and we've found um, in working with them that impact comes from the the light institutional support that they've built over time to actually be quite robust. Um, so they have two full-time staff uh, as a part of their um, medical school library, and they teach uh, two oversubscribed data science courses for grad students. These um, data science courses are really powerful tools for those grad students to start early in um, sharing and collaborating in a way, again, that's aligned with VCU's policies, but also to have some um, examples and templates and training around how to use the OSF and other open scholarship tools. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how they've done this, how they gained the um, and gathered the support for 
funding for this data science lab and these two courses, um, reach out to me. I can send you a recording of this webinar that we ran with them. It was really insightful. So just want to sort of cap off all of this tool talk with some of the infrastructure um, support that can make it even more powerful. So what does OSF institutions membership or a yearly subscription with us include? So your users from your institution get help desk prioritization. So we have a help desk that answers any and all technical questions around how to use the OSF. If users, as they often do, reach out to us with research questions or questions about um, how to take, uh, how to do research, how to do their specific research project. We often um, will work with you to figure out who we should refer them to at your library uh, or which staff member is, is best to answer that question. Um, you also have a dedicated um, product owner or member services uh, person on our product team um, who helps you through every step of the way in setting up OSF institutions and also talking through whether or not training uh, or different types of onboarding um, beyond the initial kind that we offer might be necessary. And uh, just as an aside, we do offer really amazing um, training. Uh, you can break it up into modules. You can do a five module series. Um, and that is in addition to this membership. You do have a discount on that um, training if you do sign up as an OSF institutional member. And again, we're happy to talk to you more about that. You also get a this simple institutional metrics dashboard, as I explained, which is updated, um, which will be updated by year end with much more advanced metrics um, and a user interface, as well as in the future data curation admin roles, which have been um, something that almost all of our institutional members, uh, past, present, and future, have requested. And you'll be getting kind of deep dive metrics reports on OSF usage uh, by Gretchen, um, as well as some of our other product folks uh, as well. So just as a recap, anybody can sign up for the OSF who's a person, um, not an organization or institution, but a person can sign up for an OSF account. You have unlimited workspaces, collaborations. Um, there are project storage caps um, uh, on a per project per component basis, but you can create as many of those projects as you'd like. So that's something to flag as well. Um, and uh, the things that paid membership get you are for institutions or organizations. Um, so um, in addition to um, uh, having the ability to, to curate unlimited material in your uh, you know, OSF institutions, um, on your OSF institutions page by your users, you also uh, get single sign-on that automatically aggregates that material. Um, for some of our products, you can get custom metadata um, as well as curation and moderation. Everybody gets a branded landing page for all of our products and um, some of the other things that I mentioned in the previous slide. So our pricing, um, what everybody is asking about. So pricing starts for uh, basic OSF institutions membership at $2,500 a year US. Uh, at the $5,000 level, which we are encouraging folks, especially who are who are likely to sign on after the end of this year, um, to gain access to that dashboard. So I do encourage you, um, if you are interested, talk to me now because we probably have some deals between now and the end of the year um, that are based on our ability to kind of deliver this, this new feature at the end of the year. So do reach out if you have questions. Sometimes because of... Um, uh, you know, legal review and, and other budgeting constraints, it can take us, um, you know, depending on your institution, essentially, it can take us a little bit longer to get to get your, your service started. Sometimes it can be done in a week, but sometimes it takes a couple of months. So please do reach out. Um, if you do have questions about any of our other add-on features, um, like I talked about training, additional storage, um, things like that, you can visit our website or you can reach out to me. And with that, um, I will just leave this slide up for a second. I think that um, there's only one question from Sophie um, about linking with Zenodo. Um, and um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. I will be sending through the recording as well as the slides to all the registrants. And if you do have, again, individual questions, shoot me an email. I can tell you how many users there are at your institution currently, um, how much material there is published on the platform. Gretchen and I can connect with you and, and see if um, a demo might be a, a good thing to run through with you of how OSF institutions might work. If you wanna get a recording of a run through of our 
new hot feature that's dropping at the end of the year, um, also shoot me an email and I can um, send that through to you. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you and um, you will definitely hear from us. Thank you, everybody.